Good snowy morning to all of you. You know, yesterday was such a, such a nice day. I thought we were in tropical weather, and, and with uh, the, the new uh, lights that we have installed, I thought, you know, we'd have some tropical weather. So I see that everybody has their, uh, their glasses on, and, and uh, it's just a mixture of a day. So... Uh, I'm glad that you were able to join us this morning and, and bear that weather and, 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 come to, and come into the presence of the Lord and each other. And I hope that this time is uplifting to you. And I'll be honest, I can't see a thing. If, if, uh, I will say for the lights, I thank uh, Wayne. I don't know who was all here yesterday uh, to all the the people who were here yesterday to, ex to change out the lights. Uh, it is nice and bright, and, and I'll be able to see my sermon, so I won't mess up on it. So I appreciate <laughs> Wayne. Thank you for doing that and all the, all the people who did that. And we can't take a nap anymore. Nope, I can see all of you now, so <laughs> you, you can't escape me. Well, I also, uh, today is the first Sunday of Lent, so um, obviously we, we are... Uh, decked out for Lent for, with purple, and, uh, and so I invite you this morning to also uh, begin your reflection, as we did on Wednesday, uh, to, uh, to think about and meditate on uh, the cross as we journey to the cross and to Easter morning, and uh, reflect, reflect on what it means to be a follower of Jesus. I do have a few announcements for us this morning. Susie has uh, her Bible study beginning this morning after worship. So if you would like to stay after that, you'll meet in Fellowship Hall, right? Uh, downstairs, uh, distanced and masked, and everybody is uh, invited to join you, uh, join Susie for that. In your bulletin, uh, I now started to announce this last week. We have a special speaker coming on March 14th. Um, Michael Cohen will be here to present the presentation of Messiah in the Passover, which will look at uh, the, the connection of the Passover feast with uh, our communion, the Lord's Supper. So you are welcome to join us. Hopefully it's not as snowy uh, on that morning as it is today. Even though it doesn't quite feel like spring, yet with the snow outside, Easter is coming, believe it or not. We're just a little over a month away from Easter, so that means spring and spring things are going to be coming. Sarah Circle is having their bake sale for Easter. It has returned, and I know it is by popular demand for all those goodies and treats. Uh, orders, uh, order forms are out in the commons by the kitchenette, so if you could uh, get those in by March 21st, and then pickup will be March 28th, so that you have all your goodies and cookies and treats uh, for Easter. And with Easter not that far away, we will also be uh, ordering Easter lilies for our Easter service. Order forms are out on the tables in the commons, and please try to have those to us by March 21st. Uh, are there any other announcements? If there are none, would you please rise as you are able, stay where you are, and greet one another in the peace and love of Christ. Let us begin our worship this morning with our responsive call to worship, both printed in your bulletin and on the screen. Lift up your heads to the Lord. Place your trust in God. God will not put us to shame, or let our enemies get the best of us. Come and hear how God brings truth and salvation through Christ Jesus. Jesus is our Savior. We place our hope in him all day long. Let us join together in our opening song of praise, all people that on earth do dwell.
may be seated. <clears throat> the Lenten season in which we now find ourselves is a time for prayer and reflection, for refocusing our hearts and minds on Christ Jesus our Lord. May we turn away from the darkness in our lives and trusting in God's mercy, confess our sins before God and one another. Let us join together in prayer. Almighty God, we confess to you and to one another that we have sinned by our own thoughts in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. Renew us by your Holy Spirit. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. While it is true that we have sinned, the greater truth is that we are forgiven through God's grace. To all who humbly seek the mercy of God, I say, in Jesus Christ, your sin is forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see everybody braving the snowflakes. This morning when I was outside walking in, I had to be the kid in me, and I was trying to catch snowflakes in my mouth, and they were landing in my nose. It wasn't quite, <laughs> it was like, oh, hmm, that's how kids feel, huh? <laughs> but I have a beautiful present here. It's all decked out. I can't wait to open it. I wonder what's inside. Let's see. Paper. Oh my gosh, there's bugs. Who would give bugs for a present? That's not at all what I expected, and I'm so glad they're not real bugs. <laughs> oh man, I wonder who would do such a mean thing like that. Hmm. <laughs> I'm calling in sick tomorrow if it was. <laughs> But how many times have we thought that something is beautiful on the outside, but on the inside it wasn't so beautiful? If you think of a friend who, wow, they really like you and all of that, and then when they get with other friends, they start talking bad about you. They're not really saying what, what you heard. They're saying what's in their heart. And that's not good. We, our actions need to reflect what's in our heart. So it's really easy to be nice on the outside, but then when we go home or maybe when we're by ourselves, we really think, I really don't like that person. They do this and this and this, and they were mean to me, and they're not very nice, they don't dress very well. Well, God wants us to change our heart, not just our actions, not just our words, not just our thoughts. He wants it to come from our heart so that we can love everybody. Because if you think about it, Jesus loves us, God loves us so much. No matter what we do, we all have faults, we all do things wrong, we all, we're human, so we all talk bad about each other, we criticize, we complain about people. But God never does that. He accepts us for who we are. And we have to change our heart to be more like his heart. Even though we will never be that way, we have to try. And that's what he asks us to do every day, to be more like him. So next time you think about complaining or criticizing somebody, think of my bugs here. And that's, that's how you feel in your heart. There's little things in your heart that just kind of gnaw at you if you don't have that love for other people. Even though it's hard to do sometimes, we need to love everybody. On the outside, 
through our words, through our actions, and especially in our heart. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for loving us. No matter what we do, you love us all the time, not just part of the time. Please be with us as we treat others as you treat us with love. Help us to show it in our hearts, not just through our words and actions and thoughts. Be with us this week and help us to do better, to love each other with our hearts. In your holy name we pray, amen. Our scripture reading this morning picks up where we left off last week. We are in the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 5. A little lengthy uh, text today. We're reading verses 21 through 48. Some of this will hopefully be quite familiar to you. It's a lot, but they all go together. Uh, All of it goes together in one theme. So this is the continuation of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. If you're following one of the Pew Bibles, it's on page 684. Uh, but if you bought your own Pew Bible, well, wherever page it's on in yours. <laughs> Here now these famous words. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, which is Aramaic for uh, empty-headed, maybe a way we would say idiot. If they say that, 
They are answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still with him on the way, or he may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. I tell you the truth, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard, you have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, causes her to become an adulteress. And anyone who marries the divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have, said, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Simply let your yes be yes, and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if someone wants, you, wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. As uh, most of you already know by many of my sermon illustrations, I really enjoy going to the movies. Uh, well, at least when there are movies to go watch. Back in 2015, there was a, uh, a movie, and perhaps you've seen it, especially those with you with kids or grandkids, uh, made by the movie studio Pixar named Inside Out. Have any of you seen Inside Out? It's a really neat movie. I think so anyway. The movie follows a young girl named Riley. We not only watch her, but we also get to see inside Riley's mind where five personified emotions, joy, sadness, anger, fear, and disgust lead her life or lead her through life as she and her parents adjust to their new surroundings after moving from Minnesota to San Francisco. The movie has, of course, that Pixar charm, as all, almost all Pixar movies do. It has great jokes, and it has great laughs. It has very insightful thoughts, and it also has moments where it makes you tear up. I think it's a wonderful thought piece on how our insides like our human emotions affect our outside actions and relationships. Well, we're currently going through Jesus' famous Sermon on the Mount. And last week we talked how Jesus uh, was talking about true righteousness. The biblical definition of righteousness is about being morally right in the eyes of God. 
the religious leaders of Jesus' day taught that one, in order to be righteous, one must follow the law of Moses exactly and to the T. And they even made sure that they did that by adding on extra laws. But Jesus said that it's not only about what you do on the outside, but also about what's inside of you, about your heart. If your heart has been transformed by God, then from your heart flows right character. And out of that flows right attitudes, which flows right into right actions and right words. And I think that's where we pick up today. In our text today, Jesus presents what are called by scholars the antitheses. You don't really need to know that, that's just for information. But six times, Jesus says something like, you have heard it said, blah, blah, blah. But I say to you, X, Y, and Z. If you remember from last week, one of Jesus' chief purposes as God's Christ is to fulfill the law. Now, he does that by being some of the, and fulfilling some of the promises that God has promised to his people long ago. But another aspect of fulfilling the law is what he demonstrates here by properly interpreting and applying the Old Testament scriptures. Again, a major point of emphasis is that Jesus isn't giving a new interpretation. He's not giving a new law. Instead, Jesus is giving the original intent of the law that God gave to Moses so long ago. Jesus is combating against the teachings of the Pharisees and the scribes, the the major religious leaders of the day, who had taken the law and twisted it, making it almost unrecognizable. See, they were all about how you acted on the outside. But Jesus proclaims that what's inside of you counts just as much as what's on the outside. Now, we're not going to be able to look at these statements in great depth this morning, but I think what Jesus presents here, the six statements that he presents are great examples of how God's law not only involves our actions, but also intent, motive, and purpose. First, Jesus brings up murder. And I imagine everyone that listens to Jesus, even us today, would agree uh, that murdering someone is awful. And if you don't agree with that, I don't want to (laughs) know. But Jesus takes it a step further and says that being angry at someone is like murdering them. If you hate someone, massively are angry at them and hate them, You act as if they don't even exist. You strip away their personhood because in your mind, they do not exist. And Jesus says that you murdered them in your heart. If someone offends you or if you offend someone else, a transformed disciple will instead seek reconciliation. See, that's the fulfillment. That's the purpose of this law. It's not simply to refrain from, same, to, from taking someone else's life. The purpose of the law is for us to repair or rebuild relationships when they're broken. With a law concerning adultery, the purpose of the law is, is not only to have people refrain from having sex with someone's spouse, God's intention for this law is for married people to be completely committed to one another, to uphold the marriage vows that they took. Not only that, but transformed disciples are to be disciplined with their thoughts, 
They're to control their minds concerning not only the thoughts of jumping into bed with someone else's spouse, but even before all that and and controlling their lustful looks at someone they're not married to. To transform and train our hearts and minds to be singly focused on your spouse. Then comes the focus on divorce. And this is a tough one for some of us because it sounds rather harsh. And actually, it sounded rather harsh to the first century people too. Because in these verses, Jesus only gives one legitimate reason to have a divorce. And that's sexual unfaithfulness on the part of one spouse. Now, we could sit here and and talk about, well, what about this, Jesus? And what about that, Jesus? But Again, I think the intent of the law is for married couples to value God's design of marriage. Marriage is to reflect the union of Christ and the church. Marriage is about devotion, companionship, intimacy, and procreation. It's about being content with with one another, but helping and supporting and loving one another. I recognize that divorces happen. And sometimes they are necessary in order to save one of the people. And I also recognize that I don't know of anyone who personally likes divorce. But I still believe that Jesus' words are important and stand that the purpose of this law is about commitment, maybe not only in marriage, but all of our relationships. And maybe it's more about God's commitment to us more than our commitment to God and another. The comments about oath and oaths are are all about trust. Transformed disciples don't even need to give an oath. They don't need to give a promise to someone because disciples are trustworthy because they consistently tell the truth and they consistently do what they say they will do. Again, this law is for us to follow the example of our Lord Jesus who is the truth and who gives truth to those who, who will listen. Every once in a while, I still hear the eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth line today. And again, similar with uh, divorce, I think this line can get kind of complicated and messy because I don't believe that Jesus is, is telling us to totally do away with justice here. As Christians, we believe that God is the God of justice. We believe that that God deals with the good and the evil in a just and right way. That what you do will be rewarded or punished. But what I think Jesus is getting to here is that often when we are wronged, we humans like to take revenge, not justice. And often we take revenge way too far. I know this is a little dated history, but I always remember this from history class. There's, a, there's an example of um, one taking revenge too far, and it deals with Julius Caesar, the famous Roman general who, who played a huge role in the rise of the Roman Empire. The story goes that a 25-year-old Julius Caesar was captured by pirates and held up for ransom. Well, Caesar's associates were able to raise the ransom and thus free him. But after being freed, Caesar didn't just go on his merry way. No, no. Caesar raised an army, a small army, went to the island where the pirates were camped, captured the the, uh, pirates, and then crucified them. I don't know about you, but uh, I think that's maybe going a little above and beyond Um, in the name of revenge. Instead, I think the words of Jesus here, I don't think they indicate that we shouldn't seek legal justice justice if someone does us wrong. If If someone breaks the law, if someone does something against 
us, we, we should seek justice. But instead of seeking to outright destroy them because of the wrong they did to us, we are given an opportunity to extend God's grace. The last statement of Jesus here is another tough one for us. We often hear it, and I often preach it, we should love our neighbors. And we get that, I hope. But still, in some sense, loving our enemies just sounds crazy. We find it easy to to love what God loves. We we love the beauty of creation. I mean, just looking out this morning, the, the snow on the trees is gorgeous. I love it. That's easy to love. We love our family and friends. They're easy to love. We love the people who are lovable. That's easy. But we can also find it very easy to to hate those who we think are evil. To hate the ones that we think that God hates as well. And boy, have I seen that during... Uh, this last year, especially in the political realm. Oh, those evil Democrats. Oh, those evil Republicans. They're not doing what God has told us to do. So because of their misdeeds, God must hate them, right? And if God hates them, therefore I must hate them. There's a famous quote by American author Anne Lamott that speaks to this kind of thinking. I love what she says here. You can safely assume you've created God in your own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people you do. Again, the intent of this law is for transformed disciples to to have the heart of God that seeks to love the world of sinners for whom Jesus gave his life. The reality of kingdom life affects both our internal heart attitudes as well as our external actions. They are not separate from each other. What is in our hearts is just as important as what we do. And often what is in our hearts flows into our actions, both good and bad actions. That's what Jesus confronted the religious leaders of his day about. For they acted all godly, like Susie's present. It looked pretty. They looked pretty. They looked perfect. But yet on the inside, they were full of bugs. and They were rotten. It breaks my heart to tell you of a cautionary tale that has just recently developed that involves this kind of inside-out righteousness. While going through college and seminary, I read the works, I loved the works of a man named Ravi Zacharias. He was a Christian who went to schools and universities around the world, and he taught and he defended the Christian faith to those who are not Christians. I greatly enjoyed his work, and I thought he was a wonderful, godly man. He died last May, 2020, and his funeral was a huge celebration of his work for the Christian kingdom. Four months after Mr. Zacharias' death, three women who worked as massage therapists at two day spas he co-owned in Atlanta, came forward alleging that Mr. Zacharias had uh, sexually harassed them over a period of five years. Just this February, a few weeks ago, a report was released by his ministry organization which revealed the results of an investigation. And that investigation result, uh, concluded that there was credible evidence of Mr. Z- Mr. Zacharias engaging in sexual misconduct. If you want to read it for yourself, you are more than welcome. This report was summarized uh, by the magazine Zac- uh, Christianity Today. 
The report confirmed that uh, Mr. Zacharias had asked for and received sexually explicit photos from more than 200 women over the course of his ministry. He had used tens of thousands of dollars of ministry funds which were dedicated to a, quote, humanitarian effort. But it was revealed that these funds were used to pay four massage therapists, providing them housing, schooling, and other expenses in exchange for sex. One of the women told investigators that uh, Mr. Zacharias threatened her and said that if she ever spoke out against him, she would be responsible for millions of souls lost because of his damaged reputation. Mr. Zacharias, who outwardly played a very godly man, unfortunately was a fraud, a sexual predator, and a charismatic manipulator. While he seemed to be a righteous, Christ-like man, inside he was not. This is why our heart, the core of our being, is so important. It's important for our hearts to be touched by God and transformed. Because if we act righteous, but our hearts are not, to be honest, nothing will matter in the end. Nothing that we do will matter in the end. The heart that is properly rooted in and built on Jesus is the heart that will produce good, spirit-filled fruit. I love the quote that uh, Cheryl Morehouse, our, our office administrator, tells me quite often. She says, we are an imperfect people serving a perfect God. The things that Jesus outlines in our text today are admittedly a high standard of living, especially in, in our world today. And we may not always live up to these standards. But I still believe that when our hearts are touched and transformed by God, as our own character slowly but surely imitates Christ's character, I think this kind of living that Jesus outlines makes more sense to us day by day. These are not just rules to live by. They are rules to help us flourish as God's children, both in our personal lives as well as in our relationships. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, our creator and our redeemer, we are thankful that you sent your son Jesus to show us the way, to reveal to us the true nature and intent of your laws and commandments. We are thankful that Jesus showed us that our hearts are just as important as our actions. We pray that your Holy Spirit come and transform our hearts so that we may do good things with our hands and our feet. Help us to not fall into the trap of outward righteousness while keeping our hearts from you. As we continue on our Lenten journey, may we give our whole selves, every part of our being, to you. Oh Lord, we are also thankful that we made it through the bitterly cold days this last week. We are thankful for the warmth of our furnaces and heated vehicles. We are thankful for the, that the burst pipe here at the church did not cause extensive damage. But we are also mindful and, and we pray for those who have been affected by the cold. And we especially pray for those in Texas who have been devastated by this storm. May you be with them and, and may you help them recover from the winter storm and the cold. We continue to pray for those affected by the winter weather in our own community of Omaha, especially those whose homes are the streets. We eagerly await the springtime where we will enjoy warmer weather, where we will celebrate new life. 
Until those days, strengthen us as we finish out this winter. We also pray for the people and situations that weigh heavy on our hearts, the prayers that only you know. O Father of mercy, we lift all of these prayers to you in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of our crucified and risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would you please rise as you are able, and let us join together in our hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be. May God's spirit continue to transform you, the whole you, your heart, your mind, and your body, so that you may glorify God. And may God's spirit go with you, strengthening you on your journey until we meet again. Go in the love and peace of Christ. Amen.